This podcast is on the research design and data collection steps of the scientific method. We're on the fourth step, which as I have explained in the previous podcast, can be combined with other steps. Sometimes the activities are just not separate and distinct. Nevertheless, we press on. Step four asks us to consider what the data will be for measuring our variables and testing our hypotheses. We can do neither without data. There are options to consider. Do we use a large number of cases or a small number of cases? Large n, notation for number of cases, or many cases, will allow us more variation to explain, but at the expense of depth of explanation. Small n, or fewer cases, will allow us richer explanation, but at the expense of a wide array of environments in which to test our hypotheses. Another issue is the data collection method. Do we collect the data ourselves, called primary data, or do we use pre-existing data, called secondary data? A third issue is the unit of analysis, or the who or what. We need to be clear on that as well. More on that to follow. We look more carefully at the number of cases. Surveys tend to have large n. This is needed to get a sufficient broad array of viewpoints, and thus variation to explain. We will need statistical procedures to analyze so many data, but such procedures are commonly used on surveys and other large data sets. Also, for large n, the steps in the scientific process are distinct. Let's consider the pros and cons of a quantitative large n approach to research design. The clearest advantage is that we can generalize more to a wider array of data with a large n approach. Thus, our findings are more widely applied. A major disadvantage is that the relationships that we discover using the large n approach are of a statistical nature and not necessarily causal. There are many instances of statistically significant correlations being well established for seemingly random activities. A famous example is that there is a very high statistical correlation between ice cream sales and drownings. One would be hard pressed to say that one caused the other. Can ice cream cause drownings? Probably not, unless the ill-fated swimmer ingested an enormous amount of ice cream. It's unlikely that anyone would consume large amounts of ice cream when confronted with the news of frequent drownings. Instead, what is likely to be occurring is an intervening factor, hot weather. The higher the temperature, the more likely it is that ice cream sales will increase, and the more likely it is that there will be more swimmers, hence increasing the likelihood of drownings. The correlation is thus what we would call spurious or false. Let's turn to the qualitative design, which consists of a smaller number of cases that are studied in great detail. This contrasts to the quantitative design where a large number of cases are incorporated, but only a few variables from each case are studied. In the qualitative design, the analysis is fine-grained, with each piece of evidence examined closely for connecting the dependent variable of interest with independent variables. Our example here is to consider why a world leader would wish to go to war. Another important point is that the steps in the scientific process may or, not be, may or may not be distinct in the qualitative design. Things may be more holistic in the research process, as it were. The main advantage to the qualitative method is that we can show in great detail about how changes in an independent variable lead to changes in a dependent variable. The richness of the case study can give us a certain depth about under which circumstances the independent variable is most likely to affect the dependent variable. We can determine, for instance, with great accuracy, whether or not a certain political ad had an effect on people's vote intentions, if we conduct in-depth interviews of voters. The main disadvantage to the qualitative design is that it lacks what is called external validity, or the ability of the conclusions to be generalized outside of that single case study. We can make some inferences that similar cases may behave in the same way, but we cannot be certain that they will behave that same way. 
Thus, we cannot know if a political ad will likely move voters outside of the ones we have interviewed in depth. We now turn to the matter of collecting information, or data. These are the raw materials we use to test hypotheses about political behavior. What method are we using to collect these data? There are two important classifications. The first is primary data. These are data that you, yourself, collect on your own. Perhaps you have been given approval to give your own survey. The data set that you compile based on the survey responses will be original to you. The second classification is secondary data. These are data that are collected by someone other than you. Survey organizations gather data all the time in the world of American politics. Such survey units as YouGov, Morning Consult, Gallup, and so on. Surveys are not the only way to gather data. Increasingly popular in political science are experiments, where we can randomly assign people to a control group, which does not receive a stimulus or treatment, or an experimental group, which does receive a stimulus or treatment. We can then test whether or not the treatment, or independent variable, has a true impact on the behavior of the experimental group. The behavior is the dependent variable. And because of our random assignment of people to control or experimental groups, we can rule out other factors that could affect the treatment's impact on group behavior. There are different venues in which we can conduct an experiment. One way is a more artificial laboratory setting. The advantage of this is that the setting is fully controlled with no odd extraneous factors affecting the experiment itself. It may lack an external validity or in corresponding to real-world conditions. Another venue for experiments is a field setting with more chaotic factors out of the scientist's control, such as noise, light, and activity, but potentially better mimicking the true environment for the experimenter. A natural experiment, also called a discontinuity, is an instance where a shock takes place to some sort of system of behavior. For instance, the onset of COVID-19 and its impact on the performance of the economy. We can then compare the performance of the economy before and after COVID-19 and infer that the impact of other factors are controlled for and believe that the effect of economic, on economic growth comes from COVID-19. What are other methods to collect data? Here we briefly consider four other ways to collect data. The first is through case studies. Here we acquire an intense amount of information about one case or unit of analysis. We could head to a state library's archives, for instance, and read as much as we could on the causes of a mining disaster that took place in that state. The second method is through interviews and focus groups. If there are survivors of the mining disaster, for example, we could interview them or have them meet in small groups called focus groups where we could tailor questions for them to answer. The third method is through participant observation. This has ethical issues associated with it, though a famous example is one of the conceptual artist Ravo Pusemp, who, after winning the mayoral election in the small village of Rosendale, New York in the mid-1970s, proceeded to suggest the best path for the village would be to dissolve itself and be incorporated into a larger town. The town was persuaded and voted to do so, and Pusemp's artistic work as a participant observer was complete. The fourth method is called mixed methods and incorporates aspects of more than one method of data collection. The easiest example is a case study that involves interviews. This slide summarizes the various ways in which data are collected based on the type of study. You can pause this slide for reflection and or screenshot it as a reference slide. A third step in the research design phase is to consider the units of analysis. Are we interested in studying individuals? Surveys or interviews would probably be the best data collection method. If we are studying larger land masses, such as counties or states, then we need to have our data aggregated to those levels in order to infer action based on those units. Thus, county pregnancy rates could be gathered into a data set of counties, but not states. Another question is when are we studying? Do we wish to sample a cross-section of data? This will mean that we find data for one time period, such as the 1946 Argentinian presidential election, or congressional veto congressional voting behavior for 116th Congress from 2019 through 2021. Alternatively, we may wish to study a behavior over time, such as annual mining fatalities in the United States, 
in order to infer what causes rises or declines in mining fatalities. Here's another reference heuristic summary chart of what we have discussed. The who, what, when cells are not necessarily exclusive. For instance, case studies can be of individuals, groups, and organizations. Again, this is for your reference. Your data collection strategy depends on your research design. And these are matters that you will take up in Polls 301, which is more concerned with applying these skills. Here, you're just learning about them. Another key distinction to know about is what is empirical and what is normative. The easiest way to separate the two is to note the use of the word should. Normative involves a moral judgment. For instance, there should have been as few COVID-19 deaths as possible, and that vaccines play an important role in reducing deaths. This is opposed to simply measuring COVID-19 deaths based upon different health interventions and reporting on those interventions without passing judgment. Similarly, in Ada County, home of Boise and Meridian, the two largest cities in Idaho, we can say as an empirical statement that housing prices have risen by a great deal recently. This is indeed an empirical statement. We can also state a belief that housing prices are too high, and then note the rise of prices in Ada County. Normally, social scientists do not make normative statements. And this is the end of this podcast.